down. Here we go. Lift off. Right, thank you, Jim. I'm so sorry about these technical hitches. Uh, I have no idea what's going on, uh, but I can't hear you, but I believe you can hear me, so I shall continue. And um, I've got the chat window open, so please do uh, let me know in the chat if, uh, if things start falling, falling over, falling apart again. So, um, yeah, it really is fabulous to have this opportunity to talk to you about the research that we've been undertaking at JISC. And uh, just to introduce myself, I work as a senior sector specialist uh, within the Higher Education Research and International Directorate uh, at JISC. And um, within the, the, the team that I work in, we've been responsible over the last 18 months for developing a framework and maturity model for digital transformation in higher education. And then underneath that overarching piece of work, we've been involved in a number of uh, dedicated pieces of, of research and uh, sector engagement, one of which I'm going to be talking to you about today. That's the International Student Digital Experience work. Um, but also for um, you might be interested to know that it's also the team that I work in that's been working with Helen Beetham and Sheila McNeil on the Beyond Blended work. And absolutely delighted that tomorrow we are due to launch our web guide to support um, all the resources, all the standalone um, resources that have been developed in collaboration with the sector um, uh, with a really great narrative and um, you know, and, and guidance around the use of those materials. So that's all to do with learning and curriculum design post pandemic. So uh, just thought I would share that with you as well at the start of this session. So um, I do just want to give a, a shout out to Dr. Tabitha Newman from Tim's Research Limited. Tabitha is our external research lead. Um, and uh, it's been absolutely fantastic working with, with Tabitha. A few on the few of you on the call here may well know uh, Tabitha's work with, with JISC over the years. She was very involved in digital experience insights and, and, and setting that up. But she's been working with us on this piece of work. So I thought I would start by, let's just go on to the next slide there, uh, explaining the rationale behind why we decided, be about 18 months ago now, to direct our focus in on international students and their digital experience. So back at that point in time, uh, we were coming out of COVID and we could see that uh, digital technologies were now really quite embedded throughout the student life cycle from application through to graduation. At the same time, we also were seeing significant increases in the numbers of international students coming to study in UK higher education. And the um, HESA statistics at that time were indicating that we had 680,000 international students. And so we were very mindful of how that context uh, was um, or how those students really were being impacted by the pandemic and certainly being a member organisation and listening to what our members were observing at the time was that the pandemic had shone a light in particular on the digital experience of international students, not just with their use of digital technologies, but also in terms of the expectations that higher education providers were putting on the use of digital technologies within teaching and learning. So what we wanted to do was to build on what's now, um, I believe about 18 years of research into student digital experience by looking specifically at international students. Many of you will know that the Digital Experience Insights surveys that we run nationally have been running for about seven years now. And international student data is part of that, of that overall data set. 
But what we hadn't been able to capture up until this point was really the unique voice of international students prior to arrival at university uh, and to be reporting on um, the experience that they were bringing with them um, in making that transition. So just a moment of reflection then on the international student recruitment as it was looking at the time at which we started this research. So I've just mentioned this very significant number of 680,000 international students in the 21-22 academic year. Um, and they were coming to us from um, a range of, uh, say, a range of different countries, over 200 different countries and territories, no less. Uh, and many of you will be aware that that is reflected in the overall cohort as being 17 percent of all full-time undergraduates and 67 percent of all full-time taught postgraduates. Um, but what this graph really helpfully indicates is where we're seeing the sort of the, the, the flux, the change, the significant change in composition over the last few years. So just to talk you through this then, the, uh, the blue line, uh, which you see over the last well, 15 years now, taking a, um, you know, a, an upward trajectory over that period of time, it's the one that's right up at the top there on the right hand side. That represents um, China, students coming to us from China. So as you can see over the last two or three years, that um, uh, number is just starting to, um, to plateau. The yellow line that intersects with that, um, as you can see in the last couple of years, has dropped off absolutely uh, drastically. And it won't be any surprise to you to see from the legend that that refers to students coming to us from the EU. But then what we see are three, uh, three lines on the upward trajectory, significant upward trajectory. trajectory. Um, the orange line, which is the most significant of those, uh, represents students coming to us from India. The grey line um, with uh, the HESA uh, labelling is Asia other, but we know that uh, Pakistan is a significant contributor to that data set. And then the pale blue line at the bottom refers to uh, Nigeria, but still on a very significant upward trajectory in the last couple of years. So it was really interesting to us to see um, and to recognise that not only do we have a lot of international students, but the composition, the nature, where those students are coming to us from across uh, the globe is also um, very, yeah, has it, seen a lot of change over the last few years. So to take you into the research that we've done so far, um, it's become a multi-phased piece of research. We started out by undertaking a literature search. We worked across both the academic and grey literature, but we also got to speak to some key individuals in sector bodies like the British Council, UKI, um, UKISA, Buila, for example, um, in order to understand the landscape and how, um, you know, what, what insight they might have in terms of international students' digital experience. Um, but we also got to speak to um, some of you actually working within the uh, working on the ground uh, within institutions in order to you know start to understand what the challenges um, are that international students face as they make this transition into UK higher education. So uh, we reported on our findings about a year ago and you can access that report if you haven't seen it already via the links on the screen. Um, that really helped set us up for undertaking our phase two research. So this was our direct consultation with international students. We work with 14 partner institutions here in the UK in order to um, reach their international students to start to find out really what it means for our international students um, as they make their digital border crossings. So we reported from our findings um, back in the autumn, uh, and I'm going to be taking you through those shortly. Um, and we have uh, published a few briefing papers in the last month or so, which I will also just flag to you before we finish our session today. So uh, there's an opportunity there to, um, you know, to, to take a, a deeper dive yourself into the data uh, and into the findings. Uh, and then the last point on this slide is just to say that before I finish today, I will talk to you about our next phase um, and uh, invite you to participate if you would like to get involved. So next slide. 
So in the literature, we found that um, international students were said to have something that's called or was referred to in the literature as digital shock. And that combined with culture shock, students could be negatively impacted for weeks, if not months, on transitioning to UK higher education. And I think it's, the, the, you know, the definitions, what we what we come to understand by culture shock is, is you know, I, we would, I think if we all sat down to write a definition, we'd probably have something quite similar to what we see on the screen here, which is a, uh, a quotation from Yukiza. But digital shock um, was not talked about in very specific terms, and that's really why we wanted to enter into this next phase of research to find out what those shocks were that international students were said to have in the literature. And in order to do that, we turn to the Network Readiness Index um, within phase one in order just to try to understand a little bit more about what the challenges students might be facing given the different countries um, that they, um, where their prior experience has been through, through uh, living, through schooling, uh, potentially through working before coming into UK higher education. If you haven't come across this network readiness index before, it ranks countries uh, in terms of um, oh, about 60 different indicators, I believe, that, that, so different data sets that they work with in order to try and rank countries based on their digital maturity and, and readiness. They organise their data into four different pillars, and the pillar that was going to be really helpful to us was called, or is called, the people pillar, because it makes reference to the digital capabilities of individuals and organisations, and it also makes reference to you know, the level of resource that individual countries have. And in terms of those countries that I referenced um, a couple of slides ago, so the countries where we're seeing significant um, significant uh, numbers of students coming to us. Um, you might be interested to know that China was ranked eighth in the 2022 report. India was ranked 46th, Nigeria 100th, and by contrast, uh, the UK came in 19th. And interestingly, the NRI said that it was the, in, uh, the countries that were ranked 50th and below that were going to have the greatest challenges, or oh, sorry, had the greatest challenges in transitioning to um, digital teaching and learning during the pandemic. So with those insights, we set about our second phase of, of research and it gave us, as I say, the opportunity to, um, to really find out what the, the nature of those digital shocks are for international students. So I want to spend a little bit of time before I go into our findings, just talking through um, the approach that we took to our research. Um, just a couple of headline stats to begin with. The first is that um, we had over 2000 uh, individual responses from international students through our cross institutional survey. And then we went on site to nine different universities. Uh, one university had both a London campus as well as a uh, home campus and through those focus groups we met and spoke to 150 students. Um, so what I just wanted to sort of talk through here uh, was some of the um, some of the considerations that we gave to ensure that we got really honest feedback from international students. We had found in phase one that there was a body of evidence that um, that illustrated the international students may be much less likely than UK students to share negative experiences um, for fear of what might happen to that feedback. So the uh, first thing we did was to ensure that any institutional representatives who are in the room introduce themselves to the students in the room. This was for, obviously for the focus groups. Um, and, um, and we also requested that those representatives did not sit or stand near the students um, during the activities and whilst they were um, completing the tasks so that the students didn't feel that their anonymity was being compromised in any way. Also, when we were recruiting participants, the students were told that um, external facilitators were going to be joining the session. 
um, and, and running the session, that uh, students were participating, um, who were participating need only share a nickname. So we didn't want to know um, who the students were uh, other than to be able to um, link in a, in a non-digital way their outputs with a name. But it didn't need to be their real name. And all the activities you say were carried out offline um, so that we didn't have a digital um, trace of, uh, of their identity. Uh, and the last point there, um, we did reimburse students for their time. Each, um, each higher education provider um, had a, an overview of the findings from the focus groups. Uh, that was uh, important at the end of the project. But also from the outset, uh, we gave them an information pack for them to, to use, which included information about data protection, about ethics, if they needed to go to a research committee in order to get ethics approval. Uh, we drafted email texts that could go out to students along with a student information sheet. So we did provide quite a bit of support for uh, the institutional partners that we were working with. But on this slide, you get to see um, that there were three activities that we carried out with students. The first was uh, a digital journey. So using that uh, sheet uh, on the bottom right hand corner, um, we invited students to talk to us about how they had engaged with, interacted with digital prior to coming to the UK as well as on, on transition. And you can see uh, the different components that were um, categorised there. Then we moved into a, a mapping exercise. So the um, the handwritten sheet uh, you can see there is from, from a student from one of our focus groups, where we asked them to, um, to log all the digital that they encountered. Um, and then I think what was really powerful about this exercise was then getting them to share their feelings about those different technologies. So you can see a combination of uh, unhappy red faces uh, as well as happy green faces. Um, and this actually provided us with an awful lot of uh, really rich uh, data from the session. We also invited students to then expand on um, anything that they shared with us in terms of their digital journey mapping or um, with the, um, you know, with, with that exercise that you can see really nicely illustrated there by the student uh, in question. So um, what we did find whilst we were talking about digital within teaching and learning, um, students did also share uh, a broader set of concerns with us, um, which we touch upon within our, uh, within our uh, report, but um, we have very much stayed within our brief of looking at digital within teaching and learning. So uh, uh, just wanted to share with you, I think it's really important for you to understand whose voices are included in the data set. So I mentioned early on that in terms of the overall national cohort of PGT students, um, we have about 67% who are international. Within our uh, data set, we had slightly more, we had 80% um, who contributed to our research. Two thirds of respondents um, said that English was a second language. And the vast majority of participants came from um, the continents of Asia and Africa. More specifically, a quarter of all respondents were from India uh, and a fifth from Nigeria. But despite the fact that we have um, still have, you know, most, most of our international students still coming from China, we did see far fewer Chinese students in our data set than in the national cohort. But we think that that was largely down to the fact that um, many of the institutions that we were working with were actively recruiting to emerging markets, i.e. India, Pakistan, Nigeria. But what we did find in the data was that there were significant differences in the responses, depending on where in Asia students were coming from uh, or reported being from. So there is a, um, you know, we have separated out different subregions of Asia um, so that you can um, get some clearer insight into those differences. Um, we had a significant number of mature students respond. So as you can see, the focus group, uh, we had a third of all participants focus groups were, were, were mature um, and not just mature, but over 30 uh, years of age. Uh, and that went up to 38% in survey data. 
And then we saw a gender split in favour of females um, also. So you see there a 60-40 ratio. Just another word or two about the mature students, uh, because again, I think it's really important that we just stop and reflect on the expectations that those mature students have of uh, their teaching and learning within higher education here in the UK. Um, as well as uh, their use of digital. So as you can see um, referenced on the slide here, many of those um, taught postgraduate students had, you know, they, they were professionals, they had had careers up until the point at which they started their postgraduate studies with us. And they had obviously invested significantly in the number of, um, it, sorry, in the amount that they had paid for their higher education and along with that investment, you know, comes quite, um, you know, quite a lot of expectation around the quality of teaching and learning that they were expecting on course and on programmes. So let's just have a look now at some of the data that came out of phase two. Um, and what I just wanted to stress here is that we are starting to see some significant differences depending on where students <clears throat> reported uh, coming from where their home countries were. So in the first instance, we found that almost half of all East Asian students um, were thinking that actually the Wi-Fi in the UK was worse than it was um, back home. Then we found just over half of African students were experiencing daily power cuts. And actually what's particularly interesting here is that had we not had the focus groups to follow up on some of the themes, we might have started to think that this was a bit of a, if you like, a, um, a deficit, uh, an issue for African students not having had the same experiences as other students because of the interruptions to power. But what we found in the focus groups when we asked more about this, um, about this issue was that they were used to using secondary power sources. So as the illustration, I think, really nicely uh, illustrates the difference between um, uh, equality and equity. So um, you know, rather than treating this as a deficit, it just is a, a, a difference, a different way of, uh, of accessing digital and digital technologies. Because what we found was that um, most students were actually using digital daily to support their studies. Um, and what we also found was that African students were very reliant on 4G and 5G um, mobile data and were not used to Wi-Fi at all. And one of the consequences of this was that as they transitioned into UK higher education, they uh, were um, they, they were they were getting very um, high. Um, bills, you know, their bills were getting very expensive in terms of using mobile data because it just weren't thinking about using Wi-Fi, uh, whatever messages around Edgerome had been shared just didn't land with them. So um, yeah, that was uh, really quite a, a significant finding for us. Moving on to the on-course digital experience, um, we did find that the majority of, of students were really very positive about um, their access to digital resources in particular. Um, whether they were um, resources they found um, from the virtual learning environment, the uh, access to library resources um, and uh, recorded lecture, re recorded lectures as well. So um, interestingly, we found that um, whilst international students were using AI uh, quite significantly, um, it was really that they were using it to support their um, academic English. So they um, were also sort of paying for licenses to, um, you know, to subscription versions of, uh, of AI in order to be able to support their language um, development and acquisition. But they really wanted to get clearer guidance on what was acceptable uh, use. Most of the struggles that we heard uh, referenced within the research um, were related to authentication. So for students, particularly um, during vacation periods and when they were back home, uh, not being able to access um, systems and resources. 
um, there was a particular issue with students before they came, um, that they reported that they'd logged, um, registered for systems before they arrived in the UK. But then when they tried to get back on those systems in the UK, they couldn't get access. And what had happened was that they had um, changed phones or changed SIM cards. Um, and of course, were then locked out of the systems that they had previously authenticated and, and registered on. So, um, you know, just a really clear piece of guidance that, you know, you could be taking away from today is to ensure that your international students are aware of, uh, of that. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, many international students not expecting that access to, to, to Wi-Fi and not just in terms of Edgerome, but how ubiquitous um, free Wi-Fi is in many public spaces. Let's move on from here. Um, so we did find that, um, you know, students were reporting then um, some uh, shocks, some, some challenges as they moved across into UK higher education and largely around how the technology was going to be used. They really struggled with understanding how, when and why to use digital and would really appreciate, um, or said that they would have really appreciated clear guidance on um, what technologies they were going to be using, what were university owned, what would be provided um, or they would have access to via um, other suppliers, uh, where there might be some restrictions around use, and certainly to know what they would still have access to once they had graduated. They also talked about the need for additional skills support in order to gain equitable access to their teaching and learning. And um, as I mentioned a moment ago, for those students for whom English was not their first language, you know, their, their reliance on uh, AI and those additional subscriptions, so whether that's uh, you know, chat GBT plus, whether it's um, uh, Grammarly, they absolutely, uh, you know, were, were feeling the pinch as it were, because they were paying for these additional subscriptions in order to, um, in order to support themselves, and thus creating a degree of digital uh, inequality. We also um, asked the students to share with us their comfort levels with a range of different online behaviours. Uh, and again, we start to see some really strong global regional differences in the data. So in terms of um, using webcams, it was the American students who were most likely to feel comfortable uh, in switching their, their cameras on. Students from uh, Africa and from the Indian subcontinent were those who are most likely to feel comfortable raising a hand to speak. And yet East Asian students really didn't have a preference for any of these modes of participation other than posting comments in the chat. And then we looked at the wider learning experience. So um, obviously, you know, these questions were rooted in digital experience, but did start to talk about wider uh, issues which again, um, you know, really important context in which to sort of understand the expectations of international students coming into the UK. So again, really quite happy with the digital resources uh, provided. Um, one caveat to that actually I shall just reference here is that the students were talking about how with many recorded lectures, um, they, they struggled often with um, uh, lecturers who had, had strong accents, but also where the captioning wasn't really capturing the subject specific terminology. So um, just thought I'd, I'd flag that at, at this point. But what we also found was that um, the students had um, much greater uh, expectation of having more um, directed learning. So given that most students in our data set were, were taught postgraduates, they were not expecting so much independent learning um, or that so much of it would be self-directed. What's more, they found that uh, their engagement with digital technology was largely transactional, that it wasn't necessarily being used with them in order to uh, create sense of community, for them to be able to share their experiences with one another, as well as with their tutors. Um, and the, there was a significant expectation that there would have been more face-to-face -face teaching and opportunities to have one-to-ones uh, with their tutors. In fact, they 
you know, they had quite high expectations in terms of their ability to be able to contact uh, their tutors and lecturers um, and, and mentioned wanting mobile phone numbers. Um, so again, there's a big piece of work around here around expectation management uh, around the teaching and learning experience more, more generally. So let's move in the right direction. There we go. Yeah, so as, as I've just mentioned, um, they felt that for many of them, at least, you know, the, their interaction with digital technologies was, was largely one way. But there was another shock on, to in, in, on top of the um, digital shocks and the cultural shocks. There was something around grey boundaries that was also really quite shocking to them. So, you know, the students were coming in used to getting 80-90% in their academic work um, and then that was just not happening in the UK. So for students in particular who were being funded by their parents, then there was a lot of anxiety because those parents were expecting reports back home to be talking about getting uh, similar sorts of marks. So there's something here about institutions being really clear about what the grey boundaries are, how that works um, in, here in the, the UK. Um, and for students to get really clear guidance as to um, you know what is you know what what then correlates to um, a first a two one a two two etc. Okay, so that was um, I just wanted to pick up those those particular highlights from our findings. There's an awful lot more in our publication, um, but here are a few of our kind of top level recommendations again within the report. Um, these are, as I say, just a, just a few to, to, to just indicate the kinds of recommendations that you will see within, uh, within our publication. And we've organised them by stage in the student journey. So from pre-arrival, um, transition on arrival, and then throughout the degree programme. The fifth uh, recommendation here, which is under the heading of strategic thinking, is really just to say how important we have found it to be to ensure that the needs of international students in relation to their uh, supporting their digital experience uh, are reflected in a number of different institutional strategies, that these don't just sit in an international strategy, um, but that they are all also fed through in terms of the digital strategy, or there might be a digital transformation strategy or institution, and then in terms of the educational strategy and also EDI that um, you know, there's a cross reference across all of those strategies. So um, just a, a kind of a few words of, of, of summary at this point, and then I, I want to invite you um, to do a little bit of, of, of thinking and, and reflecting. Um, so we see then that the composition of international students in the UK is changing. Uh, and it, of course, uh, we're all very aware of the changes that have been happening over the last few months, given um, the, the, yeah, the, the, the national kind of policy landscape at the moment. We've also seen that many students from what we've referred to as emerging markets of the African and uh, Indian subcontinent countries, now, these students have access to news technologies in really quite different ways to UK domiciled students. Um, and this can create digital and cultural shocks when coming to, to live and study in the UK. We've also seen that international students may require additional support in order to gain equitable access to the learning experience. And also, I think one of our key take home messages is that staying curious about potential differences can be way more useful then aiming to reduce perceived deficits. Um, and finally, whilst our focus has been on international students, we feel that many of our recommendations are of potential benefit to UK domiciled students too. So let me just share with you the details of our um, second phase report. So again, and um, Jim's got a copy of these slides and these will uh, come across to you, I'm sure, after today's session. So there are URLs, there's a QR code that will take you into that second phase report. Um, <clears throat> if you're interested, there's also a podcast on the JISC Beyond the Technology web pages. Um, and this is where uh, we have a conversation with Tabitha Newman, our lead researcher 
along with um, our institutional contact at Lincoln and our uh, partner at the University of, of Greenwich who um, supported us with, with this research. So you get to hear you know, why they're involved in the research and what they've started to do with the, with the data. So at this point, um, I'd like to share with you a, uh, a Padlet link. And uh, we were potentially going to do this in uh, breakout rooms, but given that I can't, <laughs> I can't hear anything, uh, I think what I will do is just um, address some questions. Uh, I can see some couple of questions have come up in the chat, so I'll have a look at those and address those. And in the meantime, whilst I'm doing that, it would be fabulous if you could go into this Padlet and just share with me and share with one another um, if there's one thing in particular that um, has has sort of stood out for you, that's resonated with you um, from what I've shared with you so far, it might be to do the research methodology. Um, you know, how we try and give uh, international students the kind of environment and the reassurances so that they can really openly share their experience, good or bad. Um, or it might be uh, one of the particular findings um, from the research. So uh, I'll leave you to do that for a moment. And um, hopefully you won't mind whilst you're doing that. I will just have a read of these questions and come back. Yes, Amy, let me put that in the chat for you. Here we are, there's the Padlet link. So question from Jim, thinking about online behaviours, is this something that needs further investigation? Does it point towards a kind of digital accent? Well, that's a question. Um, so given the data set that we had, um, we are particularly interested in, um, in reaching some additional geographical areas. And we think that we will be doing that through our um, next phase of, of work, which I will tell you all about uh, before we come off uh, the call. But I like that, a digital accent. I shall borrow that, Jim, if you don't mind. So, yes, uh, I think we probably will be further investigating uh, the online behaviours. Another question, if someone else was to research digital shocks, is there a kind of research tool to help focus that research on your definition or is it still quite nebulous? Oh, gosh, another really excellent question. I don't think I've got an answer for that. Um, kind of research tool to help focus that research on your definition. I think a lot of what we've surfaced in our research um, hasn't been addressed, hasn't been found in the same way. Um, you know, we, we find mention of, of students cross, you know, digital, crossing digital borders. Um, but I think what's been particularly helpful to us is correlating our data um, with that that came through the Network Readiness Index. And we're doing a piece of work at the moment where we're focusing in on four countries in particular. So that's China, India, Pakistan and Nigeria. So, you know, the same four again, which are of particular interest to UK higher education at the moment. Um, and situating those um, uh, sort of the, 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 the data around civil digital infrastructure within those countries, along with our um, student experience findings. So um, that doesn't exactly answer your question, but just to say that, uh, you know, we are correlating um, with that data set. And it's going to be a really interesting report when we publish that in a month's time. Next question, how can um, these mem members here work alongside GIST to expand and contribute to this research? We would love you to be involved. And I'm going to talk to you about the third phase of, phase of work uh, shortly um, and be absolutely delighted for you to join us with, um, with that work. And there'll be another link which I will have poised and ready to stick into the chat so that you can get in touch, uh, in touch with me. So, um, I am now going to um, carry on with these slides. Please do feel free to continue to post to the Padlet. 
um, and after today as, as well. It's really useful insight for us to see how this research is, is speaking to you. Um, what in particular, um, as, as Jim's flagged here, you know, what, what we might be looking to further investigate through our next phase of work. So please talk to us. OK, so I'm just going to spend the next five or 10 minutes finishing off these slides and then I'll see what other questions uh, you've got before we finish. So um, we have um, published three briefing papers in the last few weeks. Uh, we've got another couple of session, uh, another couple of briefing papers in the mix. One of the four country profiles, which I was telling you about, um, again, where we're really honing in on this idea of difference, not deficit. Um, and the fifth one, which is due to be published um, before the summer, is actually looking at examples of where institutions have been using our findings and recommendations to influence new, new work, new support for international students. So it's fabulous that we've got, um, I, can, I, I saw from, from, from the outset that we've got uh, John Brindle on the call today. Um, John's been doing some brilliant work at Edge Hill that we're going to be getting to hear at one of our in-person events tomorrow, uh, where we have our student experience experts meeting. And can't wait, John, to hear more about uh, the work that you've been doing at, at, at Edge Hill. Um, but we've got a number of institutional stories which we're going to be pulling together because one of the things that we get asked for, um, you know, one of the things that gets asked for more than anything else uh, at JISC are case studies. You know, institutions just wanting to hear uh, what other institutions uh, are doing uh, to have a look at their examples of activity. But in terms of the three that we've already published, which you can get to via the link on the screen. And again, let me just um, copy that link into here. Um, so the first one, Supporting International Students Digital Experience a Checklist. Effectively, what we've done here is put spotlights on the full set of recommendations. Um, and again, they're organised in terms of stage um, within the international student journey. So there's an opportunity, whatever your role um, is within an institution where you have some, um, some involvement with students, particularly through the curriculum, to look at um, what you might be doing already, where the gaps may be, uh, might, might be within your provision, and then maybe looking at um, developing some new, new support. Facilitating holistic conversations. Um, so this is basically um, sharing a lot more detail than I've gone into today. Um, <clears throat> which explains the, about the research methodology that we undertook. So if you'd like more detail about um, how we run the activities within the focus groups in order to generate really honest feedback, then um, that's the place to go. And then the third one is where we took a look at how international student experience compares with home students as um, as presented in last year's Digital Experience Insights survey data for students, um, where we found three particularly interesting uh, uh, differences. So I'll leave you to uh, dip in and have a look at, at those. But what I did very much want to talk to you about before we finish today is what the third phase of research is going to entail and look like. So um, whilst we're in phase two, uh, some of our participating institutions um, asked us whether at any point we would be switching our focus from students who come into the UK to study at an institution to students who are still experiencing a UK higher education, but in their home country or in a country that isn't the UK. So we are just coming to the end of a scoping phase where we're looking at what that next phase is going to look like. And um, we ran a survey which is, has closed now, um, but we had 36 higher education institutions who completed that. So in part, they were giving us some data around what type of TNE provision they were providing. Also uh, starting to share with us some insights in terms of what challenges students face in terms of their experience of the digital environment, but also the teaching and support staff um, their experience of supporting those transnational education programmes and students uh, and the challenges that they have in terms of the digital technologies. 
So what we will be doing um, is uh, hosting a, uh, a meeting on the 1st of July, and we will um, be talking about how that phase of work is, is going to move forward. So we um, are very open to um, the membership of that group. So in terms of your engagement with us, um, if this is something that you would find really useful to be a part of, then we would love to hear from you. I'll give you the details in a moment of how to get in touch. Um, so it might just be that you know, you, you, you're interested in the space, but it might also be that you'd be keen in due course, it'll be the next academic year when we run the research in helping to facilitate uh, that uh, data acquisition. So helping us to get surveys out to, to your students and, and staff. So um, in order to join our mailing list, then um, let me again pop this in the chat for you. So uh, by going to this URL, short URL, you'll get a very um, short little form to fill in. And uh, that will enable you to get added to the mailing list and you'll see the invite um, coming through in due course for that meeting in, um, in July. So uh, that really was my um, quick run through the data, the findings, the recommendations, our research methodology of what we've been doing to date. Uh, in addition to joining the mailing list, if you want to get in touch with me directly, feel free to do so. That's my email on the screen. Um, but I am you know, really interested to see um, what else you would like me to um, pick up in the chat. So <clears throat> bear with me a moment. Let's just have a little read to see what's come in. Let's have a look, see. Where did we get to? So, Amy, do you have any evidence about how these improvements work for other students as well as the international students? I know they will. I just often want some evidence to back this up. So we're hoping that um, we will be able to track the difference in response in due course, because in a way, you know, you need to have um, so for these changes to have been implemented in institutions. So following up the recommendations, new activity, new support to be put in place, and then for a survey to run again. Now, what we're hoping for, rather than running a separate survey to Insights, um, that we will get more questions into Insights in order for us to be able to use that one, um, one survey uh, opportunity. You know, we're very aware of, of students being over surveyed. So in terms of what we shared um, in terms of the home students, uh, sorry, students who come into the UK to study from, from abroad, then we're hoping that mechanism will allow us to do so. Um, but as I say, you know, some, some time needs to have passed post implementation of any change in order to then test the water. Uh, let's have a look. And yeah, so oh, John, so uh, John's responded to Amy. Uh, so at Edge Hill, you've run some indicative data from the first run of a pre-arrival, considered some of these and show an increase in confidence in a cohort joined in January. That's great. That's really good to hear. So you've done something very bespoke um, in order to be able to gauge a, a before and after. Jim asks, are you looking at the economic disadvantage? Apologies, you might have done this already. So um, within our questions, we haven't asked for that kind of uh, data. But um, in terms of the civil digital infrastructure, then we have, as I say, this work that we're doing with the Network Readiness Index, or I should call it actually, <laughs> the people behind that are from the Portions Institute in the States. Um, and that's where we get to see more of the, um, you know, of, of, of the, um, just trying to look at, think of some of their indicators, but where you clearly start to see um, how developed their, their country is and the correlation between that and their digital maturity. And then that in turn is then correlated with, with ours. Um, and that's, as I say, in the next briefing paper that's going to be published. So yeah, really good point. Uh, oh, God, these questions are fabulous. Uh, was there anything you thought you might find that the data didn't show? 
No, I think we went into this with a with, with an open mind. Um, as I say, we just we we wanted to get to the detail of what these digital shocks were. You know, what did it mean for a student to cross in effect a digital border? And certainly with a transnational education research coming up, then what we're interested to find is whether students who stay within their uh, home country to engage in a higher education provided by the UK. Um, you know, what are there still digital shocks? Um, are there still, um, you know, some of the challenges that we saw with students coming into the UK? How does that affect them um, when they when they remain in their home country? Um, and did you find it difficult to define the type of delivery, e.g. TNE part distance? So in terms of the work that I've presented to you today, um, no, that's been quite straightforward. In terms of the students who come into the UK to study, um, then it, you know we were looking at foundation, undergraduate, um, taught postgraduate, um, and the challenge absolutely, as you've alluded to in your question, is when we start to move into the TNE space because there are a number of different types of provision. Um, and also what we have kind of started to think about are those students who um, start their study in one country and then come into the UK for part of their programme. So um, we've been having an interesting conversation with Hisa about um, where those students are represented in the, uh, in the record. So more on that to come. But I'd be really, really keen to see you um, to see you involved in in this next phase of work. So I appreciate that is now five to three. Um, don't know where the time's gone. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm so sorry I've not been able to ask you to uh, turn on your mic to ask me questions in in person, but I, I think the chat worked okay. <laughs> And um, this me not having used, uh, you know, so used to using Teams and Zoom and not being on Blackboard uh, Collaborate before. So uh, apologies, I've not been able to get the tech to work fully at this end. So um, I'm going to shut up now. It's been great to be with you. And thank you very much for, for having me. Yeah, I'm sure we'd all like to thank um, Elizabeth for uh, a great presentation and also struggling with a little bit of technology there. Apologies for that, um, dealing with, you know, uh, different different systems is part of that digital shock that I think we're all still dealing with. So um, uh, I think it's fascinating actually, and I hope some of you do think about this for next September as a way of getting started on a, on a different type of research project or something like this. Uh, so that you could perhaps contact Elizabeth to just do something on the side or just expand one of her findings or something like this. Great way, particularly if you're say on the PG Sir or something like this, great little side project for you to get involved with. And I'm sure um, the GIST team would be really encouraging of that sort of thing. Um, so uh, yes, that's uh, another Ellie Sig session closed up and we will uh, send out the recording of this and um, all the usual things. Oh, we've got a hand up. Is that Katie? Did you want to say something? Not sure. Anyway, um, yes, I shall stop the recording.